Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast, where we explore the exciting science behind heart rate variability. The material discussed in this podcast should not be taken as medical advice. Please check with your medical provider to make sure any suggestions or strategies are right for you. Visit us at the OptimalHRV.com website to learn more about the Optimal HRV app, download a free copy of Matt's book, Heart Rate Variability, and also get show notes and additional resources around heart rate variability and its application. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I have been waiting for this episode for about, well, a little over six months now, and it gives me a great honor uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Ina Hazan uh, to the show. Uh, I, I just got to, I want to talk, you know, about all of your brilliant expertise and thinking around heart rate variability, biofeedback, uh, mindfulness, but, but I just got to say uh, how we met. And I want to give an introduction, then, then I'll shut up and turn it over to you, is uh, I, I heard you talk on another podcast, and I think about 10 minutes in, I bought your most recent book, and about chapter two, I think I reached out to you to see, do you want to work together? And unlike a lot of people in uh, the biofeedback arena, not the biofeedback arena, excuse me, but biometrics and HRV, uh, you're, you're pretty much the one person that got really excited when I talked about uh, using HRV for social work and homelessness and addiction and really sort of saw the vision that uh, I had that sent me on this journey with the Optimal HRV app. And uh, since then, it's been great uh, to build a friendship and just to, uh, as I like to say to our team, uh, sit at the foot of the Buddha and uh, learn uh, from what I consider the, the expert, uh, world-class, if not the world expert on these topics. So uh, Dr. Hazan, thank you for joining the show. Uh, it's so great to finally get to this episode. Wow, thank you, Matt. Well, you know, the, you know the, the feeling is entirely mutual and you know, it's actually hard to believe it's only been six months. <laughs> know. Uh, it, you know, it feels like we've developed this really wonderful friendship um, and have been working together so well. Feels like, you know, for much longer uh, in, a, in a very good way. Um, Ab so. Absolutely. Well, obviously mutual here. So I want to really, uh, in this episode, really introduce our audience to you in your expertise. So I would love it. And I, I, I was realizing this before we hit record. I don't know all the answers to, to, to the, the, this question. So I'm going to sit back and learn with our audience a little as well, but how let's talk a little bit about your journey. Uh, how did, what brought you into uh, biofeedback uh, mindfulness. What I loved about your work is uh, your book also is how HRV is just really a kind of a, 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 a topic that connects all these different things that whether my passion with trauma, which you talked about brilliantly in the book, but also wellness and health. So I would just kind of let give you, uh, you know, hand it over to you and, and really just talk about your journey uh, of building this expertise and, and how your career has sort of evolved uh, with your with your passion for biofeedback, uh, mindfulness, et cetera. Uh, sure. Well, we have to go back quite a while, almost almost 20 years at this point. Um, I was in graduate school. I was, you know, uh, studying to be a clinical psychologist. With, I had a particular interest in health psychology. Um, so yeah, I was seeking out trainings in health psychology, behavioral medicine, um, and you know, towards the very end of one of my uh, uh, trainings, you know, with Dr. Leslie Bourne at the uh, you know what used to be the Fallon Clinic, it's now the Reliant Clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, um, she brought in uh, some biofeedback equipment and somebody to show it to us, and it was you know a pretty big clunky machine um, that was still running DOS, right? And I am not a computer person. I looked at uh, you know I looked at the <laughs> programming part of it and went, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, but then I looked at the machine and what it could do. And I said, oh my God, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, and it was just a very, very brief, you know, um, introduction. Um, and I was finishing up my 
uh, training with uh, Dr. Bourne, and that was, you know, it was a really amazing uh, training. Um, you know, she is uh, uh, one of the best mentors, um, you know, I've had in health psychology. Um, so then from, um, from the Fallon Clinic, I then went on to um, the Cambridge, um, Cambridge Hospital, now um, Cambridge Health Alliance, um, it, to do a training in their behavioral medicine. And lo and behold, on the syllabus was biofeedback as, a, as an optional training. I was like, ooh, <laughs> okay, yeah. I guess I'm gonna have to learn some programming. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> luckily for me, equipment at Cambridge Hospital required no programming, it was Windows-based. Awesome. <laughs> uh, it's a little scary how much I'm dating myself here. But, <laughs> Well, well, God help us all if we have to go back to docs. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I took the biofeedback training um, uh, back then with Dr. Satcher Bellarose. Um, and I, I mean, I, I fell in love. It was just so great. It was so awesome to see, you know, what is going on with you in this moment, you know, in real time, you know, live on the computer screen. If I do this, you know, the, the, the amount of time I played around, you know, with, okay, if I breathe this way, look what happens to my heart rate. So if yeah. I move this way, yeah. this is what's happening. Uh, it was all very wonderful and exciting. And when I started using it with uh, um, patients, it made a huge difference. You know, as you know, I was working with people who had chronic pain and anxiety and headaches, um, and many of them, uh, you know, had come in sort of saying, you know what, at the, I'm at the end of my rope, you know, my neurologist, my psychiatrist, my psychologist, you know, says they can't re do much more for me. Uh, and I am just really suffering and, you know, don't know what to do. I don't actually think you can help me either, but here I am. Right, <laughs> yeah, right. that was, it was that kind of, uh, um, um, you know, creative uh, hopelessness as uh, I think, mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Hayes termed it. Um, and, uh, biofeedback made a huge difference for people. Uh, you know, it was really within a few sessions, you know, particularly with heart rate variability biofeedback, um, you know, with anxiety, with migraine headaches, with chronic pain, people were starting to feel better. It really, you know, to them, it felt like a miracle. Um, and to me, it was quite remarkable. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a cure. Um, you know, it wasn't, you know, snappy fingers and everything is better, but it made such a huge, a huge difference in a fairly short amount of time. And the skills themselves were really straightforward. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there is just nothing tricky uh, about what you have to do. Um, you know, I think it's tricky for the provider to understand and make sure that you know what you're doing. Um, uh, but you know, for the client, um, uh, they see, you know, lines going up and down on the screen and, you know, they know exactly what they need to do with those lines. Um, and they feel the difference, uh, you know, in the moment uh, right away. And then when they just practice uh, at their leisure at neutral times, uh, they start noticing that they feel that they're feeling better. So it was, it was, it was incredible. Yeah. Um, let me, let me, if I could just, I, I, I want to just uh, jump in here and then let you continue your story. Absolutely. For, for someone who might be joining us with, you know, an interest or a passion for, heart rate variability, but may, may be new to, to biofeedback. What, what would you, how would you give, uh, so what, what, how would you define the field of, of biofeedback? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. And I'll do a little preface and then I will answer your actual question. Uh, you know, you know, I'm coming into it from, I learned biofeedback, you know, sort of as a concept first and then got into heart variability. I mean, pretty much at the same time, but yeah. you know, the entrance entrance was through biofeedback. And for so many people, especially these days, it's kind of the other way around. You're learning about heart yeah. variability and its importance first, and then you're going, oh, and you can do feedback and what's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I always forget that piece of, you know, defining the, uh, the biofeedback of it. Um, so what this means is a way um, for you to um, learn what's happening uh, internally on the, on the physiological level, and then get that information fed back to you, you know, live in real time on the computer screen, um, giving you the ability to uh, make helpful changes in order to ultimately improve your health and performance. Awesome. Awesome. Great definition. You've done that one before. <laughs> okay. So, so you started to started to use biofeedback. Uh, so, so now you know, the interest has turned into a little bit of a practice. So, so uh, let, let's keep the journey of becoming uh, a, a world renowned author and expert uh, on, on the topic, because I imagine that did happen uh, day two. 
Um, no, nah, we waited till day day three. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Um, so I spent um, that that you know that year um, in training, you know, doing a lot of biofeedback. Um, you know, I among my training group, I was probably the most interested in biofeedback. So I kind of um, said, you know what, any biofeedback. You know, clients you have, send them my way. Yeah. So um, I got a lot of biofeedback training and a lot of practice and a lot of really great supervision with wonderful um, people. Um, so I came out feeling like, okay, you know, I kind of, you know, got the hang of this. I'm, you know, I'm getting there. Um, and then the year after that, I was an internship um, and the place where I was, Massachusetts Mental Health Center, where I was working with a lot of, you know, very severe uh, mental health issues, a lot of trauma. Um, they didn't have uh, biofeedback, but, you know, they were awesome in um, helping me use that interest, even if we, you know, they didn't have the big fancy biofeedback machines, but we were able to use, uh, you know, smaller kind of consumer based uh, uh, devices that I had, uh, and they were you know, very willing to let me kind of, you know, run with it and, uh, you know, even, you know, design my own group, uh, you know, doing biofeedback uh, in that group and teaching people breathing and, uh, you know, doing a lot, it was all heart rate variability uh, work because, uh, you know, that's what the consumer grade devices, you know, that were available. Um, so I, I ended up just kind of having to make it up and uh, uh, work with what was available, which was awesome because it actually helped me deepen my knowledge uh, and my understanding so much more because I had to make it up and because I had to figure out, okay, how are we going to make this work without the structured approach that I was initially taught? Um, and then for my postdoc, I came back to the Cambridge Hospital uh, in large part because I wanted more biofeedback training and more biofeedback experience. Um, so I did that for another year and, you know, came away, you know, got certified in biofeedback, uh, board certified in biofeedback that year. Um, and, you know, felt like, you know, this is what I want to do. You know, this is, uh, uh, this is, this is it. <laughs> it just felt yeah. like absolutely the right fit. Uh, it made sense to me. It made sense to my clients. Uh, it was super helpful to people. Um, you know, I was teaching my friends and family, uh, you know, how to do uh, heart variability uh, biofeedback, you know, teaching people how to breathe. So uh, it was, you know, very much something that was just becoming part of uh, daily life uh, for me and, you know, daily conversation. Yeah. I think my friends and family have probably gotten a little sick of hearing me talk about it, <laughs> but they're very nice about it. Um, and it was actually during my postdoc year that I met um, Dr. Chris Germer, who then, uh, and Dr. Susan Pollock, who then introduced me to uh, mindfulness uh, more deeply. I had some experience with it, but um, at that point, uh, you know, um, I became much more, uh, you know, deeply experienced and interested uh, in mindfulness. And that was another huge turning point in my uh, professional uh, and personal life where mindfulness just seemed to solve a lot of problems uh, that still, you know, came up, you know, by feedback, with heart durability by feedback was amazing. It was helping a lot of people, but there were times it would get stuck. You know, the person would be you know, staring at the computer screen uh, and, you know, trying to do something, you know, they're trying really hard to breathe in just the right way and adjust their heart rate in this way and that way. And they would tell me, I'm trying, I'm really trying, I'm trying to relax. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't happening. Um, so in one of my, um, conversations with, um, you know, Chris Kermer, I said, oh, this is so frustrating. People are trying so hard and it's not working. And he said, well, why don't you tell them to stop trying? <laughs> what, do <you> mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Stop trying? Yeah. You know, th this is what you do, right? Yeah. If you want to achieve results, you try, you try really hard. Um, and he said, well, no, <laughs> you know, you stop trying, you let, you know, you let things happen as they're happening. You let your body do what it's going to do. Um, and things just fell into place, you know, from that, from that conversation in person, I have had many more conversations uh, about it since then. But the idea of in order to make progress, you have to stop trying was really yeah. revolutionary. <laughs> um, it, you know, at that point, you know, I also had a uh, um, an infant, uh, you know, at, at home. You know, my oldest son, uh, who is uh, now, you know, looking at colleges. Um, <laughs> back then, <laughs> was a little baby who wasn't sleeping. Yeah. Um, and you know, for me, you know, trying to you know get him to sleep. Uh, mindfulness uh, practices uh, allowed for that to be to become instead of something frustrating in the in the middle of the night. Just you know, I'm just gonna stop trying to make him yeah. go to sleep. I'm just gonna be here with him. And guess what? The whole experience became a whole lot easier. I don't actually think he 
slept that much better necessarily, but I was <laughs> suffering a whole lot less. Yes. So, 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 uh, so a quick question from somebody who's probably knows quite a bit to be dangerous about mindfulness and thinks he probably knows more than he really does about biofeedback. You know, one, one of my, you know, my, I guess, perception and experience with biofeedback is in some ways that it, it's always been for me, and maybe it's just the biofeedback tools I've used, sort of a mindfulness practice. It, because I don't know, one of my definitions of mindfulness is we're, we're focused on one or two small variables. Now, usually those are like breathing or yoga pose. So I, I would just love when you were maybe pre thinking heavily and deeply about mindfulness, but, but really into biofeedback. Did, did, would you have term, have biofeedback a form of mindfulness at that point? And I'd love to hear how, as you bring these two concepts together, maybe your thinking has evolved uh, around this, or at least evolved my thinking if I'm way off base. No, you're totally not off base at all. But initially, uh, those two concepts appeared completely separate. Um, and the way we talked about biofeedback uh, back then was all about controlling things. You know, we were controlling your breathing, we were controlling your physiological function, we were controlling your anxiety, we were controlling things. Um, and, you know, that only went so far because as soon as you, you know, are getting to trying to control things that are not actually controllable, you get into trouble and that's where you get stuck. Um, and then there was mindfulness, which, you know, it was all about letting things be and, you know, making uh, progress and taking steps forward by not struggling with what's not under your control. So initially those two seemed quite disparate and um, in trying to talk about this with um, you know, other mindfulness uh, teachers, uh, they would always tell me that and a biofeedback just does not fit into this because uh -huh. biofeedback is all about making changes and trying things and doing things and that's not what mindfulness is. Um, and it, that wasn't really clicking for me, but I couldn't quite figure out why and what was going on. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure exactly how and what happened. I don't have a moment when a light bulb went on, <laughs> uh, but it must have at some point, uh, because at some point, what occurred to me was the two actually go together incredibly well. And yes, biofeedback um, can be a form of mindfulness. I don't know if it is, it, it's necessarily inherently so, um, but biofeedback practice can absolutely be mindful and it mm -hmm. can absolutely be a form of mindfulness. And you can absolutely bring mindful changes into a mindfulness practice uh, while allowing you to still be a mindfulness practice when you're not controlling things, right. um, which would be very much anti-mindfulness. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the two just seem to fit together. And again, in my conversation with you know Chris Germer, the idea of that the, the biofeedback and mindfulness being the middle way, you know the you know yeah. the, that a parable of the lute in ancient in ancient Buddhist story just kind of came together. This is it. Um, uh, should I tell the story? Yeah, briefly? tell the story. Yeah. I love the story. Okay, yes. all right. I like that story. I like that story a lot. Um, so in uh, you know ancient India, um, there was a son of a uh, you know rich businessman. Uh, his name was Sona, and Sona wanted to achieve enlightenment. So he gave up his earthly possessions and he went off, um, you know, to meditate and find himself, etc. And he was working really hard, and that's what you know he wasn't quite getting there. Um, he wasn't achieving enlightenment. He was getting frustrated. So he went in search of the Buddha, and he he found the Buddha, and he asked him. Hey, you know, I'm trying really hard. This is not happening. What do I do? And the Buddha, knowing that uh, Sona was a skilled lute player, asked Sona, all right, so, you know, when, Sona, when you're playing the lute and the strings are tuned very tightly, is the lute uh, tuneful and easy to play? Oh, no, 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 it doesn't sound very good. Hmm, okay, so what about if the strings of the lute are tuned very loosely? Can you play it well then? No, it, it doesn't sound very good at all. So what about if the strings of the lute are tuned just right? How does it, how does it sound then? You know what? That's when it sounds great. Uh, the lute sounds really well that you, when uh, the strings are tuned just right. So the Buddha says, so well, there it is. Um, so in the middle way between trying 
and letting go. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, it's got to be just right. A little bit of trying and a little bit of letting go. You, if you're trying too much, it doesn't work. If you're not trying it at all, it doesn't work either. Yeah. So this is exactly how biofeedback and mindfulness work together. Biofeedback helps people uh, make uh, changes uh, to the present, you know, to the present that are helpful without trying, without effort, without a struggle. Um, and mindful, and mindfulness allows people to make those changes in a way that are under their control. So you're not struggling with something that you have no control over, but rather you're making mindful changes in a way where you have control so that you can actually make a difference and make progress. Um, and in that, in that sense, but I feel like in mindfulness are really just a perfect match um, for each other. Um, when, you know, biofeedback skills can reduce the intensity of suffering in the moment so that people can become and be willing to be mindful. You know, imagine if somebody is having a panic attack or in the middle of a traumatic mm-hmm. flashback, um, you know, being mindful in that moment is really difficult, uh, you know, especially for people who are not uh, master meditators. Yeah. So bringing in some uh, you know, heart variability practices into that moment will reduce the suffering. And then you can be mindful um, and suffer less as a result. Um, and then, you know, when uh, people are practicing mindfulness, you know, just being able to see what's going on uh, on the screen uh, and doing so, uh, you know, in that mindful way, right? You allow, allowing yourself to notice that I, I know what's happening. I know what's going on internally enhances the practice so much. Um, and in many ways, you know, bringing heart variability uh, practice into mindfulness is, you know, as much as the word shortcut is not the correct one for mindfulness, but it does give you a little bit of a shortcut because it allows your breathing to fall into that rhythm that enhances mindfulness, that uh, that allows you, you know, your body to be in that optimal zone where it's easier to be mindful. Your body is, is functioning at its, uh, at its best and at its optimal. Yeah, and I, I, I really got, and I, I won't torture our audience with it again, uh, into this like idea of mindfulness and shooting free throws for, for, for myself is, is thinking about, you know, and I, I'll admit, never, never get really pumped up and excited about practicing mindfulness. Like, it's part of my morning routine. I get my 20 minutes in because I think that's what the research tells me I should be doing. Uh, you know, so, so uh, but I'm always happy after I do it. But, you know, it's kind of like practicing free throws in basketball. But one of the things that I find that heart rate variability and the biometric piece gives me without it to some extent it's like i i don't see the shot go in like like it allows me to feel like it just gives me i mean here here's here's my brilliance feedback right it gives me like hey I, i'm hitting this in the way that this practice is really designed to do and and yeah it's maybe uh we could probably have six episodes on the human mind and what that's doing, but you know, I'm getting that biological reward that I'm putting in all this time to do. And and for me, that that's where I love the the biofeedback piece is uh, I'm getting to, I'm maximizing the time, I, I guess. Again, it's like opening my eyes and making sure the shot goes in. So now I can match the, the skill development that I'm doing with the outcomes. And that's where where I got really excited, like your book, I, I just think is the most brilliant bringing together uh, the, these concepts of, of how do we merge these two to really get whether we're a clinician working with patients or in our own practice, uh, you know, the maximum results. Uh, I think that's a perfect description of it. Yeah, it really allows you to maximize your results. It allows you to maximize, you know, kind of get, get the most bang for your buck, um, right? You know, you, whatever yeah. efforts you're putting in, you're going to get a lot more out of it if you're doing, um, if you're doing whatever you're doing mindfully. Yep. Yeah. So, so when someone, you know, comes in as a patient or client to to work with you, and, and I imagine this is, there's a lot of variation in this, but, you know, as, as somebody with, you know, you're also a clinical psychologist. So, so you've got all those skills, you're, you know, published author in mindfulness, a, a world-class expert in biofeedback. You've got maybe more tools than most of us could even dream of. How do you start, you know, how do you start to integrate 
you know, the biofeedback and mindfulness, again, if there is a typical case, which I know in psychology, there's hardly, but how, how do these things integrate into uh, the work that you do clinically? Um, you know, actually, um, it, it, I mean, on the one hand, you're absolutely right. There isn't a standard way. There is absolutely going to be, you know, unique nuances with every single person I work with, but there is a way to, um, think of it as a progression that, you know, generally follows, you know, this, you know very similar path, which makes it uh, much easier to teach uh, to others, because it's not like, well, you just kind of have to throw in a, a pinch of this and a, you know, a pinch of that. Uh, but more, you know, th there is a, a progression. And yes, you have to be flexible um, at each step, and you have to customize as to each individual client's needs. Uh, but you can, uh, can you know, uh, see this, right? So the way that I work with people is that um, I do all the, you know, biofeedback uh, assessments right off the bat. Um, you know, the, well, I first do just your initial psychological evaluation because uh, that is definitely a good thing to start with when you're working with people. Um, but then um, we'll do the biofeedback assessment to see, all right, well, what's happening uh, with a person's physiology? You know, what happens to their um, heart variability at baseline? Uh, what does their heart variability do when they're stressed? You know, what happens in recovery moments and what happens when they are, you know, practicing meditation, uh, et cetera. So at first, I just want to see what are they coming in with? Uh, what's happening uh, initially? Um, and then I'll um, I'll start teaching the mindfulness before I get into actual bio, biofeedback okay. or heart variability training, um, because I want to minimize the struggle. I want to create a situation where people are not trying to change. They're not, you know, they're not trying to do anything. Um, but rather, you know, they, they've learned how to allow their body to uh, use these uh, uh, practices in a non-struggling way, uh, kind of get them away from trying to control stuff uh, and um, into uh, making mindful changes. So we might start with, uh, you know, certainly exploring the concept of mindfulness. And, uh, um, you know, I like to do a, uh, you know, reason meditation with people or a chocolate meditation, you know, I personally prefer chocolate yes, to reasons, you but you know, <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can do this with those sorts of things, uh, or, you know, here and now stones, you know, if, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to have to hold something in your hand, uh, you know, rather than eating. So there's certainly lots of, uh, um, and, and this is where the, that flexibility has to come in, right? You know, your, you know, the person's first introduction to mindfulness is going to be a little bit different depending on what they're coming in with, but generally something that's, you know, an external focus because it allows people uh, to more easily focus, um, you know, on that um, anchor uh, and not get so caught up in their own internal stuff. Um, so once, you know, that becomes something that people could do, then I'll introduce uh, uh, mindful breathing practices without biofeedback initially, or I might record, uh, you know, might get a recording of the uh, breathing practice uh, with, uh, you know, with HRV, uh, but uh, not actually be giving feedback, just not showing it to them. I just want to see what happens. Again, and this is really to, ma to minimize the struggle. I want uh, to teach people how to allow their breathing to be before they start making changes. And once that's happening, that's when we introduce changes. This is when I might, uh, you know, show people how to allow themselves to mindfully follow a pacer. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is not let's control your breath. That's not it, right? Because yeah. that often leads people to take overly big breaths. They might, uh, you know, go, uh, create some unhelpful changes to their respiratory physiology. They might overbreathe. You know, all sorts of things might happen that are not. Um, that are not what we want. Uh, so this is not about controlling the breath, but rather you know, allowing the body and the breath to fall into that um, rhythm um, and letting the pacer guide them. So mind, uh, mindfully following the pacer. Uh, and people can do that uh, at that point, you know, fairly easy, easily because they've had the practice of just mindfully breathing without controlling things. Um, and, you know, so then, the, you know, the uh, HRV training progresses, you know, we'll determine their residence frequency breathing rate um, and, um, you know, how people breathe um, um, at that, um, uh, you know, at that optimal, you know, mm -hmm. breathing rate, uh, you know, in the office with me uh, and then, you know, on their own and, you know, learning their own internal cues. So they're not always dependent on the pacer, uh, you know, although, of course, now it's, you know, so handy to have a device yeah. um, that way you can check, you know, check in with yourself um, and, you know, have the pacer, you know, when I was first starting out, you know, you know, you had the pacer in my office and that's it. There was, you know, unless you had right. a watch with a second hand on it, yeah. <laughs> that was it, right? <laughs> That's all you were doing. 
Uh, so it's so much easier now um, to have a mix of, you know, allowing yourself to just breathe uh, on your own and falling, allowing yourself to fall into that resonance frequency pace, but also have something to check in with and guide you uh, as needed. Um, and, then, and at that point, I, you know, so I start bringing in mindfulness in a little bit more structured, a little bit more formal way. Um, so as we're practicing resonance frequency breathing, it's always from the mindfulness perspective. Mm -hmm. We're not struggling, we're not controlling the breath. Um, and once the person has that, then we'll start um, bringing in more formal mindfulness meditation practices that we start out with um, a resonance frequency HRV uh, practice initially, uh, allowing the body to fall into that uh, pace. And you know, the people have already had some practice at that point. So the body is not going to be falling into that pace a lot more easily. Um, and then uh, practicing a mindfulness meditation, whatever it might be, you know, whatever is right for them. It might be, you know, mindful breathing. It might be, you know, a mountain meditation. It might be body scan, you know, you know, they're also, you know, that it might be self-compassion practice, um, whatever it is at that point, that's right um, for that person. We're incorporating both um, biofeedback and mindfulness. And some people uh, will do uh, just a dedicated uh, HRV bio biofeedback practice, and then they'll do a separate um, mindfulness meditation practice that's you know still uh, using the biofeedback skills they have. Um, and you know, I find that to be uh, ideal. But for some people, you know, two practices a day is just not going to happen, which is yeah. a lot of people. Um, so we can be creative. You know, it's either we're alternating one day just an HRV practice and another day you know, HRV enhanced meditation, yeah. um, or half and half, and in, you know, in one day. So there is a you know bunch of different ways in, in which we can do this. Awesome. Uh, so much to unpack there. I can't wait for future episodes. Uh, the resonance uh, frequency breathing, that that training in the app, uh, I, I just loved going through that. Again, it's like made it really concrete. And I loved uh, uh, how we could then match my pacer to what, what I need. And really, really cool to uh, watch this as version of version came out, uh, evolve uh, over my phone and, and learning uh, from, uh, from this and seeing your, your expertise just being integrated here and uh, that real biofeedback. I, I always wanted biofeedback as part of the Optimal HRV app, but I knew it was like this whole new expertise that probably initially if when it was just Jeff and I, it was me going out and getting. So uh, your book, much less uh, just the, the great uh, fortune that we've had for you to join our team is just, it's amazing to start to, to, you know, give the ideas to the folks that then know how to create that in technology. It's just been so awesome to see. Um, it's, it, that's been amazing, you know, you know, having conversations like, well, you know, we should really do this. Let's, yes. you know, put in a pacer, let's have it, uh, you know, figure out your, you know, low frequency and your max minute and it suddenly appears magic. I, I, yeah. <laughs> you know, there it is on the phone, you know, on the, on the optimal HRV app. Um, it's, it's been uh, an amazing uh, journey in a very short amount of time. You know, yes. The way that all that has um, shaped up has been really pretty incredible. Absolutely. So let's say in the, 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 minute, the few minutes we have left, let, let's take folks up uh, to the, the present situation. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, your books. Uh, like I said, the most recent one, I uh, also had to put it out there for folks because sometimes, you know, I, this was always a big thing for me. There's a great audiobook version out of it. And uh, as a, someone who just always has an audiobook on in my ears for the most part, great audiobook uh, with it. So, so let's bring us up to, to, to the present. Sure thing. Um, so the, I guess I have to go back a tiny bit before coming back to the present, but you know, my, my first book, the one for professionals uh, was born out of my uh, work with my students. Um, you know, I've been teaching uh, biofeedback at Harvard Medical School for quite a while. Um, and, you know, I've had to kind of, you know, put together, you know, these worksheets and, uh, um, you know, fairly detailed outlines and labs for, you know, what do you do, you know, when you're trying, when you're determining someone's resonance frequency breathing rate, what do you do? You know, I would have to write it out step one, step two, step three. Um, and, you know, I've been doing that so many times at some point I, I decided, you know what, why don't I just put it together in a book? Um, and um, it just so happened that 
I had done a, um, uh, a book review for um, uh, Wiley Blackwell. Um, they had, you know, emailed me a book and said, hey, you know, should we publish this? Um, and I gave them some feedback and I said, well, you know, and since we're on that topic, you know, would you like to publish something like this, yeah. you know, a guide for professionals and buy feedback? And they said, absolutely. Um, so that was a, you know, a serendipitous start to my first book. And then a few years later, um, I, um, a, an editor from Norton um, reached out and said, hey, you know, I loved your book for professionals. Would you like to write one like that for everyone else? And that's, you know, that's the book that you found. Um, that, you know, goes into a lot more detail, uh, both in the, you know, HRV and breathing and how to do biofeedback, but also a lot more uh, on the mindfulness piece. And, you know, how do you integrate uh, those two uh, together? So my hope, you know, for that book was, you know, for people to have this comprehensive guide uh, for, um, how do you incorporate you know, the principles of psychophysiology, biofeedback, and mindfulness into just daily lives, you know, whether in formal practice or just in how you approach uh, daily challenges? Yeah. And, and like I said, if, if you're interested in this topic uh, of HRV, you know, I, I loved it because even after I probably read 200 plus books on trauma and every journal article I could find. You know, what was really I loved about your book too is, is talking about the stress and trauma is, you know, really learning how, uh, learn one, just learning more, uh, taking that deeper dive into, you know, with your expertise on, on the nervous system and that piece, just, just an amazing job of, of putting that out in a way I think is accessible to, to everybody. And uh, which uh, led me uh, again, about six months ago to uh, uh, reach out uh, in, in the hopes that we could work together in some ways, because what, what I really thought after reading the book and then talking to you uh, uh, once is all I needed after the book and the podcast I listened to was like, boy, if we could create Dr. Hazan's app like that, that was like my, it's not Matt's app. It's like, boy, if we could bring all this expertise, all this knowledge uh, and innovation into the optimal HRV app, we'll have the best app in the world. And I, I still believe that. And, and it's been fun to work with you over the last six months to uh, uh, get this next version out that uh, is by far not our last version, but, but boy, just loving to see uh, one, it's kind of nice just to hand this off, but two, it's just like amazing to see how, how this is, is coming to life. So uh, how can, um, obviously at uh, optimalhrv.com, uh, they can find out more about you, but if, if they want more details about the book, where else can folks uh, find more information? Get the book on Amazon, <laughs> www.norton.com. Uh, you can get it on through my own website. If you just put my name into Google, my website will come up, uh, you know, either inahazan.com or bostonhealthpsychology.com. Uh, both of these websites will have that information. Um, and uh, I don't know, perhaps there might be a link in the uh, Yep, we'll show put some links in the today. show notes. And uh, we've got uh, more episodes uh, with Dr. Hazan on the books. Uh, uh, not sure exactly, maybe a few weeks uh, from when this one is published, but uh, we're going to get into uh, the vagus nerve, which is a topic I cannot wait to discuss uh, uh, with you and really take a dive, uh, you know, now that once our audience has been introduced to you, go read your book, uh, take a deeper dive into uh, what heart rate variability, other biometrics are, are really telling us. Because that was like the great, uh, one of my great really passions for HRV, uh, biofeedback, mindfulness is, you know, as a, a, a counseling psychology guy, you know, just utilizing these skills around, okay, what improves heart rate variability is things that I can bring into my practice, whether it may be talking about even things like diet and exercise, things we never even mentioned in any class I was in, in my three years of graduate school. We weren't talking about that, but really bringing all this science into really helping people uh, who may be struggling in a lot of ways, but also just might want to lead their best life. So it is has been a huge honor to be on this journey with you, my friend, and I can't wait to continue to share your expertise with our audience. And thank you, Matt. Um, you, 
I was so incredibly impressed, you know, with you and your mission when we first met, you know, I think I've told you, you know, I, you know, the reason that, um, you know, I wanted to meet with you, you know, your email just, you know, screamed passion for, <laughs> um, you know, all the important things, you know, from HRV by feedback to trauma, to serving people who need this kind of uh, work the most and tend to have the least access. Um, it just really, you know, it spoke to me as an incredibly important uh, mission. And then, you know, having met um, you and Jeff, you know, my, I guess my fate was sealed. Um, you know, we, <laughs> I'm very excited to be doing this uh, uh, with you and looking forward to talking more about it in the future. Absolutely. Well, thank you, my friend. Again, you can find show notes, optimalhrv.com. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next week for another episode. Everybody have a good one.